The built environment is the part of the environment formed and shaped by humans. That includes buildings, structures, landscaping, roads, trails, signs, utilities and so on. The built environment has evolved over time. So over time the design and physicality of our built environment has changed dramatically. There's a number of different drivers that have caused this change. So the first change is demands of society. If we look at the picture on the left hand side there, that's the Cronogs, which are very traditional of Ireland. And let's think, you know, when people were uh, designing and building those Cronogs, why are they built such way? Why are they designed in this way? Let's think of our own home. Let's think of where we live now. What is the main um, thing we want from our home? Well, we want to feel safe. We want to be comfortable. Uh, we want to be able to perform whatever functions that we want to do. So let's look at the Cranogs there. To uh, feel safe, how are they safe? Well, we can see it's safe that uh, it's a, a, a little island in the middle of waterway. So the only entrance uh, to it is across a bridge. There's also a, a little um, lookout over that bridge. So if somebody was coming to attack us, uh, what we could do is we could throw down hot stones on top of them. We could remove the bridge if necessary. Uh, the only way across is the bridge. We can also see that the high fence around it with the um, spikes on top of the timber also makes us safe. It's actually pretty hard to find these as well. It's in the middle of the forest, so we're safe uh, away from people who have to find us first. It's also safe away from the uh, natural environment in terms of wind, for example. All the trees around it are making us uh, safe to block the wind from, from the Cronox. How about comfort? Well, let's look at the reeds there. They're used for the roof on, on, the, um, on the buildings. That means when the rain falls, it falls off the, the reeds uh, and then falls down uh, outside. So we're dry inside it. The reeds also act as insulation to stop the uh, heat from escaping to keep us nice and warm. Also, our animals are safe as well. So we've got the fencing around us so the animals don't escape, so they're safe in around us as well. And they also have, uh, we can feed them there as well. So safety and um, comfort are two main things. Like our homes, we've now got a uh, five-point locking system on the front door. We've got alarm systems in our house. Uh, we've got secure windows and so on. That makes our homes safe. Our homes are comfortable because we have a heating system. We have good insulation system into our homes. And um, we've got uh, electricity run straight into our homes. We've got uh, um, cables for the internet and so on. Uh, so we've got lots and lots of modern uh, needs and modern demands of society. So the picture over on the right hand side uh, could see some parallels to the Cronogs, uh, but this is really bling, uh, really high demand from society here in terms of wanting uh, the same functionality in terms of safety and comfort, uh, but also there's lots of other um, requirements for this house on the right hand side. Another driver for the evolution of our built environment is growing populations. So we can see from the graph here uh, how the population has grown. So from 1900, so the early 1900s, less than 2 billion people on the planet. Whereas 100 years later, 2000, about 6.5 billion people on the planet. So we're up around 7 billion people now currently on the planet. Uh, so a lot, lot more people. In 100 years, uh, a lot more people on the planet. If we also look at the graph there, you can see the dark a part of the graph compares to the light grey part of the graph. The dark part represents the urban population and the grey part uh, represents those that aren't living in the urban population, so a rural population. And we can see at the 1900s most people were living outside urban centres. Whereas by around the turn, turn of the century it's about half and half. About half the people lived in, uh, live in urban areas and about uh, half in, in the uh, outside the urban areas. And as we move on 20 years later, now it's more like uh, 60 or uh, 40 in some areas. So 60% in urban, 40% in rural. And it can be even higher in other parts of the population. So by 2050, it's expected that about uh, three quarters or more of the people will live in urban areas compared to um, rural areas. So not only is the world population growing significantly, uh, so by 2050, potentially have 10 billion people on the planet, it's an increase in the need for more buildings and more uh, infrastructure. So we need to increase the built environment because there's a significant shift in the percentage of people living in urban areas. So we talk about the built environment. That's not just the buildings. That's all the transport uh, needs uh, to get people uh, around between the different buildings, between different areas that they want to go to. It is all the waste that we have to get rid of. So 
the systems to get rid of the waste, so the wastewater from our buildings, the waste from all the things that we don't use. Uh, also the clean water, the infrastructure to get our, us the clean water there. Places for us to uh, work, places for entertainment, places for education and so on. That's all part of the built environment. So therefore the change in the size and face of our towns and cities. As we put more people in our towns and cities, there's more demands in our towns and cities. So we need to take that into account in designing our urban environment. So let's take a closer look at uh, Galway City. This is uh, Galway City many years ago. And how has it changed uh, towards modern uh, days? So towards today, what does Galway City look like compared to uh, previously? Well, this is the old map of Galway City uh, overlaid onto a more modern satellite image from Google Maps of Galway City. So you can see in the heart of the city, uh, the current city, the old medieval city, the old city, uh, is still uh, similar to what it was in the past. Uh, the waterways are very similar to what they were in, in the past. However, we can see that the city has sprawled. We've got, uh, it's, it's growing in terms of its area, it's sprawling along by the coast, it's sprawling out. So as we see the area sprawling out the west uh, way, out towards uh, Notnacar and so on, with lots of new buildings going out that way, lots of new housing estates going on that way. It also has sprawled out to the right hand side, towards the west, or sorry, the east of the city, uh, mainly uh, industrial estates there and housing as you move out uh, into different parts of the city. So the city is getting bigger in terms of its footprint. That means a sprawling network in terms of our roads, uh, our infrastructure to get people around the city, uh, also in terms of the electricity, energy systems that we need to provide uh, energy to our homes, to our buildings where we have uh, schools, our hospitals, um, and so on. We also uh, need uh, school buildings, we need um, um, places for entertainment and so on around there. So more and more need is sprawled around the, the city and spread around the city. Is this sustainable development? Uh, let's look at that in a little bit more detail later on. So we can see the maps here that were produced by the ERSRI for Ireland in terms of the population uh, growth. The one on the left hand side is the um, a map of Ireland from 1986, where the population was 3.63 million people. So we can see uh, the darker uh, the dots on the on the map, uh, the high, more highly density the populated areas are. So you can see Dublin, for example, in the east. Uh, you can see Cork in the south, uh, Limerick in the midwest, Galway in the west, and so on uh, in there. Then the middle one is from 2016, from the census in 2016, and we can see the population increase from 3.63 million. Uh, over the 30 years to 4.79 million people. And again, we can see that the, you know, those population densities, we can see how Dublin and its suburbs and the surrounding regions, the population has increased significantly around there. You can see Cork uh, a little bit more uh, increase in population as well. So we can see that the commuter belts are coming in. We can see more uh, blues around from the satellite towns that are feeding in the cities and so on. And the one on the right hand side, uh, it's the projected population density for 2041, uh, where the population would have gone up to 5.54 million according to these predictions. So again, you know, we can see uh, on the east in particular around Dublin, the commuter belt around Dublin, significant increase in terms of population there, uh, around Cork City, uh, Limerick and so on. So what we need to do is, up to now, this hasn't been managed in a very good way. So the government decided that they need to better manage as looking at their projection of uh, increase in people and how can they better manage uh, where people might, to, might live. So the projection pattern of population, you know, change is clearly focused in and around the big cities, particularly Dublin. Many rural parts of the counties like uh, Kildare, Meath and Loud have projected to increase their population density to more than 50 persons per square kilometre by the eastern co uh, coastal corridor is projected to have essentially urban character in there. But really what we need to do is have a more balanced uh, development across the country, not just focused on the east. And that's what the government have tried to do uh, in Ireland 2040, uh, our plan, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail later on. Okay, so the third main driver uh, in the evolution of a built environment is changing, changes in technologies and uh, applications. So historically builders worked with, with uh, what they found using very simple technologies with little variation in building and infrastructure. So effectively what materials 
what technology was available locally there. And that's represented there in the stone arch bridges that we see around our countryside. But today, post-industrial revolution, many different materials are available, such as steels, plastics, man-made panels, and so on. So there's an endless variety of applications, new technologies, and so on available to us. So that allows a much more varied building stock to be created, much more varied um, built environment to, to be created. Hence, driving the evolution of our built environment. A fourth driver in the evolution of our built environment has been changing our increased building typologies. So these advances in technology and materials allow us to tailor our built environment in a much more specific way, so more cogn cognizant of the nuances of individual functions. So for a building, uh, normally it's form and function. Uh, so what's the form, what's its shape, um, how, how big it is going to be, and so on. Its function is uh, what it's going to be used for, uh, how it's going to perform. So as a society, we've developed new types of living, new types of working, new types of playing patterns that create a demand for new types of structures. So for example, a huge stadia, like on the bottom left-hand side there, the bird's nest in Beijing that was created for the Olympics over there, uh, like clean rooms and laboratories on the bottom right-hand side there for creating, say, chips for our computers or uh, biomedical uh, applications and so on. So those needs would not be there. Well, the stadia might have been there, but say the clean rooms and the laboratories wouldn't have been there in the last century or a couple of centuries ago, whereas now it's all part of modern day living that we need these clean rooms and laboratories. And a fifth uh, driver that I've chosen here that has had a large influence on the evolution of our built environment is changing people and players. The reason why we procure buildings, so basically the motivation factors and the methods and laws applied to procurement activity have changed. So historically, people would have built what they immediately needed, so usually for personal or family tribal use. So again, think back at the Cronogs, uh, that they were built you know, for a need uh, for the family, for the family to live close together, to mind their livestock, um, so, so to be able to live safely and comfortably. But today, a huge portion of the development of our built environment is driven by property speculation and profit. So the change in motivation has an immediate impact on the type of buildings and structures that are being built. So the type of buildings or the type of built environment that's been built, we'll have to look and see what's the most economical uh, solution. Is it leasable? Can we lease it? Can it be easy to sell it? Uh, it has to be profitable. Needed to get it up quickly. Speed of construction is very important. And hence, we see lots of semi-detached houses around Ireland because they're very quick to build, uh, relatively cheap to build uh, economically, and they can be sell sold relatively easily. But we cannot keep going on with that. We need to change if we're going to have a sustainable built environment.